Alrighty, alrighty, alrighty. Good morning, good morning, and a pleasant good morning to each and every one of you. It's great to have you with us here on Dialed In. I'm Tom Brenneman. We come your way twice a week. Casey, okay, so just pop that back up there, please, if we could. Good morning, by the way. Good morning. You doing all right? Yeah, I'm doing good. I mean, when you're here solo, you know, you got to be on all of it. Yeah, I got I to gotta make sure everything's squared away and... Uh, I was here pretty early for that. You were. Uh, I still find ways to. That's okay. We all do. You had a good weekend? Yeah, I had a pretty good weekend. It was a, I'm starting to really like this time of year, Tom. Yeah. Because I, I'm, I put a tweet out the other day when this, uh, when this happened, but Saturdays for me now are baseball, soccer. It's just sports all around. Yep. So I, it's, I'm really enjoying it. I get to just have a day where I just watch nothing but sports and uh, and it's better I mean let's be honest about it it's better when the weather was like it was this weekend oh yeah absolutely. I mean it's unbelievable again again today here in Hamilton Ohio nothing but sunshine we're creeping up in the high 70s I don't know if we're officially in spring yet or not because we know how the weather is around here you know you always feel like we're gonna have another one of those blasts where it's 48 yeah or a high you know yeah in April but we'll see uh, welcome to Dialed In. Great to have you with us. We come your way twice a week live here on Mondays at 9.15 a.m. on Chatterbox Sports. And then we post a little bit later on in the day on the Believe Network. Fridays, we're on both networks. We post on Believe. We're live on Chatterbox Sports at noon following off the bench. You can join us. Just go to YouTube, the Chatterbox Sports page. And you can download us anywhere, anytime, wherever you find your podcast. Just download or search Dialed In with Tom Brenneman and your dialed in Fridays we like to have a big interview we've had what Chip Carey in the past we have had uh, Chris Myers from Fox we had Justin Williams from the Athletic to talk about NIL and all that kind of stuff Charlie Goldsmith talks by last week I thought was a really interesting uh, interview Uh, and apparently some of you did too because our downloads were through the roof with Stan Conti longtime trainer in Major League Baseball with the Giants Dodgers Marlins but he was also the director of medicine for all three of those franchises. And uh, he has studied for better than 35 years injuries, particularly pitchers and injuries. And that's all everybody's talking about right now. How many pitchers are getting hurt and requiring Tommy John, shoulder problems? Check it out. Stan Conti was with us last week. We invite you to follow us on X at Tom Brenneman TV, and it's great to have you with us. What a weekend for the local nine your Cincinnati Reds. As you and I talked last Friday, they were going to the south side of Chicago to face a bad White Sox team. And when I say bad, goodness gracious, I had no idea they were that bad, right? That team is awful. So the Reds would did what you're supposed to do when you play really bad teams, swept them. First sweep of the year. Cincinnati outscored Chicago 27-5 over the weekend. Now, most people like to talk about the 27, right? The big hits, the home runs, on and on and on. That's good stuff. But on Dialed In, we like talking about the five, as in five runs allowed. Starting pitching was unbelievable. Andrew Abbott goes seven on Friday night. Graham Ashcraft almost gets through six yesterday, but the story was the return of Nick Lodolo after basically missing an entire year with a broken leg. He is without question, and we've said this many times on the show, that when he's able to take the ball, he is by far the best Reds pitcher. There's no contest at the end of the day between him and Hunter Green. None. None. Not to say Hunter Green can't be a great pitcher, because there's always that chance. But Lodolo really has a chance to be a special guy. TCU alum. Went five and two-thirds innings on Saturday, allowed one hit, one walk, struck out 10. How about that for a season debut? With a three-game win streak, the Reds hit three games over 500, nine up, six down on the year. They trail co-leading Milwaukee and Pittsburgh by a game and a half in the National League's Central Division. Competition gets a little bit better, and I say a little bit better starting tonight as they open a three-game set in Seattle. The Mariners are 6-10, and, and listen to this stat. This is, this is all you need to know. They played one more game than the Reds, okay? They have scored 49 runs. They're one of four teams in Major League Baseball 
that has not scored 50 runs so far this year. For comparison's sake, the Reds have played one less game. They've scored 90. Frankie Montas starts for the Reds. George Kirby for Seattle. Kirby, his first start, went into the seventh, didn't allow a run. His last two games, he's allowed 13 runs over seven innings. Congratulations to Andrew McCutcheon, first-class guy all the way, always has been. He clubbed his 300th career home run yesterday at Philadelphia. He is the 13th player. Think about this for a minute, right? And I'm not here to suggest that Andrew McCutcheon is a Hall of Famer. But when you stop and think about this, there have been 13 players of the tens of thousands of players that have played baseball in the major leagues. He is one of 13 players, 2,000 or more hits, 400 or more doubles, 45 or more triples, 300 or more home runs, 200 or more stolen bases. That is pretty amazing. All right, shifting gears for the second time in three years, Scotty Scheffler wins the Masters. The world's number one ranked player finished 11 under par to beat Ludwig Oberg. That kid's going to be good. Beat him by four shots. Tommy Fleetwood, Max Homa, Colin Morikawa finished four under par. Scheffler joins Tiger Woods and Jack Nicklaus, the GOAT Jack Nicklaus, as the only three players to win multiple championships at the Players' Championship Tournament and the Masters. Scheffler, if you watch yesterday, and look, you know, yesterday, for whatever reason, I watched a lot. I don't know why. It was a beautiful day outside. I was outside a lot. But I always love watching the guy who's the best player in the world when it's truly nut-cutting time. If you watched that yesterday, you had like five or six guys that were right there, right? And then one would... Drop one in the water. Another guy had a bad bounce. Homa did coming in on a par three. It hit the green hard and skipped up into the bushes, had to take a penalty. Morikawa just fell apart, had a couple of double bogeys. Scheffler never screws up. And if he does, I was introduced on the broadcast yesterday to something called basically a comeback hole, which after you have a bogey or a double bogey or something like that, what do you do the next hole? He's the best player on the tour in that category. He had the best score of any player on the course yesterday, 68. Man, when you're number one and you're sitting in first place and you fire the best score of the day, that is getting it done. That's a big leaguer, Scotty Scheffler. Congratulations. For those that care, do you care about the NBA playoffs, Casey? Uh, I'll care about it just because there's some uh, – it becomes gambling serious opportunities. Again. Yeah, there's some more serious gambling opportunities because okay. now they're starting to actually compete again. Right. Whereas, like the last like three weeks, they've just kind of been yeah, whatever. Well, some teams have been playing hard because they're trying to get in the playoffs. Eh, kinda. Right. Yeah. Kinda. Okay. Uh, well, the NBA playoffs start tomorrow night. Now you have four teams in each conference. We'll start a play-in tournament. Okay, so one through seven in each conference is already decided. These other four teams are playing a tournament to decide who's going to be the eighth seed. So in the east, the four teams are the Bulls, the Hawks, the Heat, and the Sixers. Out west, pretty interesting out west, because you got the Lakers and the Warriors, along with the Pelicans and the Kings. Boston, the number one seed in the east. Cleveland is a four seed. Oklahoma City is a top seed in the West. I want to get to a couple of things and, 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 and thank all of you who are in the chat. Uh, some of you might have some points or some questions and all that kind of thing. Well, uh, uh, Evan wants me to do the Scotty Shuffler Shuffle. The Scotty Shuffle? Scotty Shuffle. Noah says, Casey, you're looking good this morning. Well, thank you, Noah. That's very, very nice. I appreciate that. All right, look. Um, there are a couple of things that occurred this weekend. You and I were talking about this off the air. I mean, there, there's a lot going on. You got baseballs getting rolling. You got the Masters, right? You got the yep. NBA playoffs starting. So NCAA is over now. And, and let me preface this by saying I, I don't care whether you like Ohio State or Kentucky or you just have complete disdain for one or the other, if not both, because they are both easy to like because they win a lot. They're also easy to dislike 
because of their fan base. Let's be honest about it, okay? I mean, I'm an Ohio State fan, but there are a lot of Ohio State fans that just, I mean, it's over the top, way over the top. Uh, Kentucky basketball is the same thing. Having said that, What I watched this weekend from those two schools is it really is, if you're able to separate yourself away from it a little bit, not get wrapped up whether you're a fan or whether you're a hater. It really is amazing, the fan base of both of those schools. And I'm not here to suggest there aren't other schools that have great fan bases too because there are. But I'm not sure there's a greater fan base when all is said and done When you think about the size of the university in Ohio State's case, they have alumni coast to coast, okay? Two things happened on Saturday. A network television broadcast, the entire Ohio State spring football game. That was a a two-and-a-half-hour infomercial for Ohio State football. (laughs) It was on Fox. I mean, now think about that for a minute, okay? Again, take a step back. The Ohio State football game has one of the major networks televise its spring football game. They didn't televise it on national TV in Texas. They didn't do it in Alabama. They didn't do it in Georgia. They didn't do it in Michigan. They didn't do it at USC. Ohio State had a a two-and-a-half-hour infomercial and had 80,000 fans at the game. Now, there are other schools that will put in 80,000 for a spring game. Alabama does it regularly. Uh, But, I mean, are you kidding me? Think about if the the Bengals play four scrimmage games, three of them now in the preseason. They're lucky to get 40,000. Lucky to get that, right? If the Reds played an exhibition game against Shohei Otani and the Dodgers, you wouldn't get 30,000, maybe, right? Right. If you see in their spring football game, now I'm not comparing UC to Ohio State. That's unfair, but I'm just trying to put it in perspective. And then the other one is Kentucky. I mean, I couldn't believe what I saw and what I read about their press conference to introduce their new head coach, Mark Pope. Pope was a player at Kentucky. He transferred and played his final two years there. He was a hell of a player. Hard nose. He only averaged about eight points, but seven rebounds. Dirty, tough. I mean, not dirty player, but just tough. Got dirty. Did all the little things you need to do to win. And he was part of a national championship team in 1996. So he's named the new head coach, leaving BYU, coming to Kentucky. They have a press conference. Most press conferences we watch, there are maybe... 20 members of the media in a room, and then whoever the guy is you're introducing to do whatever he is, free agent player, coach, whatever you might want to say, right? They put in 21,000 people at Rupp Arena for a press conference. Even Seth Davis, who's on CBS, you saw him during the NCAA tournament, he even acknowledged it on X over the weekend. He said, I've never seen anything like it in my life. This was a fan base that was really down on the program. They were really down on Cal. They were really upset that they didn't make a run for Danny Hurley, right, from Connecticut, that they didn't get Scott Drew from Baylor. And they were wondering who's going to be the coach at arguably the second most prominent basketball program in America is Kentucky after North Carolina. And you get 21,000 people for a press conference, and man, did they do it up. They brought up a bunch of guys back from that 96 team, Pope's teammates. They introduced them coming out of the tunnel. Look at this. This is sold out Rupp Arena. They had Derek Anderson, had all these guys. Can you imagine the work of just rounding those guys up and say, hey, can you get in here? Now, a lot of them might live in Lexington or live in Kentucky. There's Pope. And, ma'am, I got to tell you, I loved what the guy said, Pope. Look at him. (laughs) Look at that scene for a press conference. 
Yeah, it's kind of wild, isn't it? It, it? It's unbelievable. And I tell you what, if, if you are a fan of any team, and all of us root for this team or that team, whoever it might be, and we get so tired of trust the process. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the same over and over and over again. Every one of them like clones. Well, Pope steps up there yesterday in the press conference, and he says, we are second to nobody at Kentucky. We're second in nothing. He said, my BYU team had the second best defensive efficiency in the country last year. Kentucky will be better. He said, my team shot the third best three-point shooting percentage at BYU last year. Kentucky should be better. He said, our job is to come in here and put banners up in this building, Final Fours and National Championships, and win SEC tournaments, which a lot of people were really down on Cal because they thought he didn't think it much of the SEC tournament. I just can't believe it. I can't either, Tom. I mean, it's, those, those fan bases are so loyal. And when you say trust the process, those fan bases – trust the process to a fault almost it does not matter what they do any decision that is made at Ohio State at Kentucky is usually met with that sort of response that sort of backing that sort of hoorah right and uh, it's kind of neat to be honest with you that there's so many people that have almost a blind faith for their team making the right decision. Well, they give them a reason to, though. Yeah. Right? Yeah, they've, they've never really been led astray no. either. No, it has been rare. And, I mean, you're talking about 40, 50, 60, 70, 100 years, whatever it is. I mean, Ohio State football has had one losing season in, like, the history of the program. Right? Right. So, I just, I, 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 you know, and some of the guys in the chat here, and, and I've never understood this argument. Now, if we were living in California, all right, or you're living in Nags Head or Hilton Head or Siesta Key, right, where you got a beach, you got a lot going on, you got great wa- you know, weather pretty much year-round, and people like, like, like Justin jumped in. And we love Justin. I'm not picking on Justin. But he says, uh, those 80,000 people who went to the spring game, they need a hobby. And then somebody else said, uh, well, uh, in Lexington, there's nothing else to do. Well, what the hell is there to do around here that's any different than Lexington? And you can say, well, we got the Reds, got baseball, true. But they're out of town. Right? Got the Bengals, too. Well, I know, but they're not playing now. Yeah. Okay. I'm just saying, on, on, if you're just going to take a single day last Saturday and you get 20-something thousand at Rupp Arena, you get 80-something thousand at uh, Ohio Stadium, um, you know, and, and, and to come up with the, the, the reason that there's nothing else to do in those towns, there's plenty to do in those towns. And the weather was great all weekend in both of those towns. I just can't believe it. All right, before we get out of here today, because we got uh, off the bench coming up here in, in about 25 minutes, I got a question for you. Yeah. I know you're all in on this whole Bengals draft thing. It's, a, it's one week from now, right? Next week? It is one 25th. week from, from Thursday. Okay. And that this year it's in Detroit. That's right. That'll be fun. That, is that a Ford Field? No, I don't think it's on. I don't think it's at Ford Field. It'll be outside it's, somewhere where you can get more people. Correct. Okay. All right. I'm sure it'll be great because they got great fan base, football fan base at Lions. Uh, I mean, that, that's the flip side, really, which might make the Lions fans even more amazing. They have given you nothing to get excited about forever. You've never been to a Super Bowl. And yet, I, I mean, they're, they're, they're fans. They just show up. Great fan base. Anyway, could you explain to me, and I'm being very serious about this because I don't understand this and maybe you can guide me. Okay. Okay. I keep hearing all of this talk about the Bengals wanting to draft maybe even in the first round a wide receiver. Okay. okay? Yep. All right. Now. This isn't in theory. This is in reality. If the Bengals want to tag T. Higgins this year and again next year, they can do it. That's correct. Those are the rules the way they're set up. Okay? So if you just said to yourself, okay, we're going to have T. this year, and I love what he said over the weekend, that he's come to love Cincinnati and wants to be here. And I mean, he's a great dude. I mean, how do you not like that guy? 
Uh, but, but theoretically, you will have reality, practical. You, you will have Chase. You will have Higgins for at least one year, if not two, two more years together, right? right? You drafted your guy downtown, Charlie Brown, right? To yep. be a wide receiver that you think can be good, Charlie Jones. You have um, uh, Yoshi, right? Who right. you think is going to develop into a player. Why, if the blueprint in your division and to winning games in your division has been defense, right? Right. Steelers, Ravens, and Browns, defense. All made the playoffs last year, right? Yep. And they have quarterbacks that, you know, that to greater or lesser extent, but pretty solid in the division. If the, another year for Watson, we'll see. You got uh, Russell Wilson coming back, Burrow coming back. I mean, it's pretty doggone good. And we know about Lamar, league MVP. Why would the Bengals draft a wide receiver in the first round? Uh, well, the only scenario I think that could happen is if one of the top four fall to them. And the, the top four are Malik Neighbors, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr., Romeo. Well, Marvin Harrison Jr. ain't dropping down there. I mean, I, give I, me I know. A break. I'm, I'm just telling you what All those right. scenarios are. All right. Romeo Dunes, and then the other guy that people kind of point and link to the Bengals is Brian Thomas Jr. And um, I just don't see the Bengals taking a receiver, to be honest with you, because I don't know if one's going to fall to them. If they were to, the idea of it is. One, they haven't really replaced Tyler Boyd. Yes. And if you if you want to say that Charlie Jones is that replacement, he didn't really show you a whole lot. He no. runs really fast uh, east and west. We know that for sure. But he didn't really outperform guys Yoshi like – Yoshi was much better than him. Right. But in fairness right. to Charlie Jones, he was hurt a lot of the year. That's correct. Yeah. But it's also a player that they don't – they took a swing on Charlie Jones – and it was a swing that they don't usually make on that type of profile for that guy. Older, uh, his breakout in college didn't happen until super late. Right. Um, you know, just those things, I think, make it to where they're not settled on Charlie Jones as the Tyler Boyd replacement. It was a nice swing, but it's not a for sure thing that they're willing to, to go with into this next year. And – you look at the, the T. Higgins thing, um, maybe they don't want to tag him for that second year. They could, theoretically. They could. They could, but it is, it's going to cost them next year probably like $27 million Well, I read over them. the weekend that they, ha they are going to have a ton of money next year available. A ton. Now, they're going to pay Burrow a ton. And they're going to have to figure out what they're going to do on a long-term deal with Chase. Right. Right? Yep. But my goodness, I mean, I, I just, you know... I. And, and they, look, these guys have forgotten more about football than I have. So maybe they, they, maybe inside the building, you know, they're looking around and they're going, you know, kind of like the Dax Hill situation, right? And maybe Hill turns out to be, I'm not throwing in a towel on Hill. He's only his third year in the league. But clearly they didn't like what they saw. They brought in two new safeties in the offseason. Correct. Right? Yeah. Brought back Von Bell and they bring in Geno Stone. So um, maybe in the building they know that for the long term, maybe Yoshi and Jones aren't the guy. Maybe. I'm not, I'm not saying that for sure because I don't know. I thought, I thought Yoshi showed incredible promise for this team. Yeah. He's big. He's strong. He's fast. He's an unbelievable athlete. He's got good hands. To me, that is a weapon as a slot receiver because he's a big, strong dude. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, maybe Giusecki fills that role this year. Right, because he's going to be split off the line of scrimmage frequently, almost always in a slot receiver kind of position as a tight end. Um, oh, all right. Anyway, you know, it's going to be exciting, and I know you're going to be following, so we're going to talk a lot about this next week, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Casey, thank you. No problem. Everybody, thanks for being with us. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Don't forget, Off the Bench is coming up on Chatterbox Sports. You can find us on the Believe Network. Download us anywhere. Just search Dialed In with Tom Brenneman and you're dialed in. Have a great Monday. We'll see you on Friday.